almost regular <laughs> Zoom meeting of the <laughs> Kildova Hills Board of Commissioners to order 6.01 p.m. How's everybody doing? Doing well. Um, we usually start off with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. It's always painful because of the delays. Should we, should we try it one more time? I think so. Uh, we we got to try it. It's the, it's the American way, right? But uh, I'll just close my ears and start and we'll all try to do this together. Ready? <laughs> I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag, to the flag of the United States United of America, America and to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. all. That is super hard to talk at the same time. But I thank you for giving it a shot and uh, trying to keep a little bit of normalcy in here. Mm -hmm. um, as we go into our moment of silence, I, I really just want to remind everybody that even though we have COVID fatigue and nobody wants to think about how bad it is and how bad it's getting and how much worse it could get, that uh, it, is, it is more dangerous out there than it has been both in our community, across the state and across the country. And um, it's gonna be worse before it gets better. And all we can do is all do just a little bit more to uh, keep our circle small, take all those precautions and try to keep each other safe. So let's think about, as we take a moment of silence, all, all the folks that are, are in the hospital right now and the folks who've lost folks and, and uh, keep them in our thoughts uh, because there will be a lot more uh, in the months and weeks to come. So uh, let's take a moment, please. Thank you guys, really appreciate it. Uh, so uh, we have an agenda. I think, uh, do we need to formally uh, amend the agenda? Because I think we've added one item. Um, I guess I can make that motion to amend the agenda to, to add, uh, is, is that true? Is Bobby out and going to be able to make the meeting and make yeah, the presentation? I'm here, man. Oh, you're, oh, there you are. I couldn't see everybody. Uh, okay, so I guess, uh, where are we putting that on the agenda? First? Uh, introductions and presentations, item number two. Okay, gotcha. There we go. Uh, we'll, we'll call that your motion to uh, amend the agenda. Is there a second? <laughs> John Winley here. Oh, okay, we've got a motion from uh, Commissioner Gray and a second from Commissioner Winley. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I will go through the roll call to vote. Uh, we know that Terry is an affirmative and Mr. Windley is an affirmative. Uh, Ivy, how do you vote? Yes. All right, and uh, BJ, how do you vote? Yes. I'm in the affirmative as well. And so we have an amended agenda. The next motion is to approve the amended agenda. Uh, I'll go ahead and make that motion. Is there a second? Second that motion, Mayor. Mayor. All right, we have a second from uh, BJ. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, you know that BJ and I are in the affirmative. Ivy, how do you vote? Affirmative. That's affirmative for Ms. Ingram. And uh, Mr. Gray? Yes. And Mr. Windley? <clears throat> yes. All right, we have an agenda in the painful style of Zoom 2021. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, as we get started, we've got uh, public comment. So if, um, do we have anybody queued up to do live uh, comments today? I can't see everybody. Mr. Mayor, we're checking just one moment, please. Okay, thank you.
Hello? Hello, Mr. Garber? Yes, how you doing? Okay. We have you We have you ready for a public comment. If you please uh, just start okay. by giving your name and your address, please. Uh, Scott Garber, 211 Sunset Drive in Keel Level Hills, North Carolina. Welcome, go, go ahead. Hi, uh, do you want me to start speaking now? Just talking about, I assume everybody wrote, uh, read the uh, public comment or do you want me to read that for the record? Oh, whichever you're more comfortable with. We've all, we have all read it. It has been uh, entered into the official record and uh, I certainly, I guess for the public, why don't, why don't you go ahead and read it yourself and, or, or put it in your own words, whichever you'd like. All right, I'll read it. Um, I did have some other comments. I want to hope that I can add to that, but I wanted to try to keep this reading in five minutes. Right, right. We're trying to keep it to five minutes. Exactly. Just to be fair to everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as I introduce myself, it's Scott Garber. I'd like to congratulate you and your staff uh, on the work-related Meekins Field Community Park Project Award. I'm hearing some feedback through the thing, but somebody needs to mute. I'm not sure who that was. Sorry about that, sir. Not a problem. But just to uh, congratulate you on the award that you had at Dare County from the Tourism Board at Meekins Field. But respectfully, I would like to add that out of the 160 responses from the town-sponsored citizen survey, some of the top priorities, including sports courts and fields and recreation programs, are not clearly outlined in how they will support the adult community. And that's why I would like to turn your attention to the aviation park and the underutilized roller rink that belongs to Kill Devil Hills. Our pickleball group has a great idea that could accomplish some of those top priorities that were mentioned in that survey for Meekins Field. Mr. Mayor, if you acted on this idea, you would help Kill Devil Hills be a leader in the development of the fastest growing sport today called pickleball. It's played on a 44 foot long by 20 foot wide tennis type of court, regardless of your age, athletic skill, everyone, everyone can play the sport. It's a fun social level and a competitive skill set. Um, USA Pickleball Association is a recognized organization that according to 2019, the Pickleball Participant Report there are more than 3.3 million players in the U.S. making it one of the country's fastest growing sport. And Kill Level Hills can get in front of this uh, now for its residents. Um, I've listed names of residents of Kill Level Hills. I won't read their names out, but uh, they're listed on that sheet. But we would like to suggest to make the roller rink into a multi-use sports court that would include and not leave out the skaters but add basketball and pickleball usage. The facility is 180 feet by 80 feet and we would fit five pickleball courts, two full court basketball and, and a shared floor space that still could provide area for skating and inline hockey. Additionally, if you remove the post nettings from the surface, you have a large community gathering space for events such as arts and crafts or music events. So the multi-use sports court does not limit your use if you add the activities of basketball and, and pickleball. Our group could teach pickleball and develop a junior division for after school. And because this complex is lighted, we could have leagues or open play in the evenings for the working adults in Dare County. If you look at the bigger picture with the tourist part in mind, we could host championship pickleball weekend tournaments for all ages the junior division, the 19 to 50 age, and the senior division. As an example, Virginia Beach had over 450 players signed up for their first annual Mid-Atlantic Regional Tournament this past July, 2020. Pickleball would be, is played by men and women, singles, doubles, and mixed doubles, usually in a two or three day event. And that is calling out for the need of restaurants and hotel services. As a resident, we know KDH can support the needs, can support events like marathons that you have in Kill Level Hills. We can raise funds to support the needs of improvements in the future for many types of sporting events or community events that could be held in this complex. But the roller rink is here now. 
It has all the infrastructure in place, such as bathrooms, concession stands, parking. To build this today brand new, your cost would exceed $250,000. Pickleball is already growing in this community. The seniors are retired and have a place they can play all day. But don't forget about the working class that get off from work at 5 p.m. Residents in Kittle Hills need a place to play pickleball to help support the growth of our sport without age or property restriction. We reached out to two tennis surfacing companies for an estimate to install and resurface the entire roller rink, adding pickleball lines, basketball lines, and roller derby skating lines, and hockey and soccer lines. Those quotes were an amount of $25,550 or 31,126 respectively. We hope you will help us grow pickleball sport and expand on this idea presented to you and your fellow commissioners. As written in the town sponsored city citizen survey, the word fair, that is what residents want to understand and how their tax dollars are spent. We know this idea is a great deal and a benefit for KDH and its residents and visitors. Plus it is fair for the cost of the quotes submitted related to how much is spent on youth sport versus adult programs on the mainland. As I say a lot of times, a lot of us are old now and adults would like a dedicated place to play day or night. I also would like to thank you, Mr. Mayor and the Board of Commissioners for all that you do for the residents here in Kill Level Hills. And we hope you will come join us and play pickleball on this multi-sport complex. Just a couple notes, we did invite Commissioner Ms. Terry Gray and the Westside group to come and watch our group play. So far, Mr. Gray made an appearance in early November and hopefully we can attend a WSG meeting sometime in January or next month to share some ideas of why repurposing this roller rink into the multi-use sport court is a win for KDH. I did copy a Outer Banks voice of just what was written in there on 1215 and it just recognizes in the bottom paragraph there that it asked for improvements. Half of the respondents indicated they'd like to see expanded restroom facilities. Other top priorities included sports courts and fields and recreation programs and path and green space. So Mr. Mayor and commissioners, we did offer you a pickleball paddle and a ball. We hope we invite you and hope you will make this uh, multi-court happen. Oh, you're muted, Ben. Mayor. Trying not to distract people and I was shuffling papers there. Sorry. Thank you for that, sir. Um, we also appreciate you forwarding the materials you did and, and all the research that went into it. Very nice work of advocacy. We also heard from uh, many of your fellow pickleballers. Is that the term? <laughs> um, uh, over the last few days, uh, which has been great. You know, we've also heard from a lot of the gals from the Roll Derby and a few of the folks that play uh, inline um, hockey there. And uh, we are hearing you loud and clear that, um, that there is a, a lot of enthusiasm for this. Uh, we did go a little long on that. So I do wanna make sure that other folks have the opportunity to speak. Do we, we have anyone else lined up for public comment? Just one moment. Thank you, Michael. Megan Shaw has raised her hand and asked to speak during public comment. Hey guys, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. This is interesting. Um, yes. Thank you for letting me submit public comment. Um, I'm a resident of Kill Devil Hills. I'm a hey, Shaw. Yes, sir. I apologize to interrupt. My name is Michael O'Dell. I'm deputy town clerk. Could you please give your name, first and last name, and also your address, please? Sure, it's Megan Spencer Shaw. 907 Cardinal Street. Um, I'm also a rookie on Kill Devil Hills Derby Brigade. I use the hockey rink at Aviation Park to practice with this awesome group of ladies. And like a lot of local outer bankers, I've followed these guys for 10 years. Um, I just became a member and again, I'm, I'm a rookie, it's hard. Um, but I really feel like it's something that the town of Kill Devil Hills can be proud of. 
um, this type of sportsmanship is unique in general, but it's also unique to Kill Double Hills. These girls have been out there since 2010. It's their home headquarters. Um, I did a little homework today with Tanya Hill. She told me that it, um, Aviation Park was resurfaced in 2017 for the um, exclusive for the roller rink and the smooth surface. So it's safer for us and the hockey players that play out there. Um, she said that was done with some town money. I would really encourage the Kildare Hills um, commissioners to take pride in the Derby Brigade because if, if the courts resurface, we can't practice there. It's got that exclusive smooth surface. Um, it would take away those headquarters that have been there for 10 years. And again, I'm, I'm just joining these girls, but I've watched them. The whole Outer Banks has watched them. I feel like it's exclusive. Something for Cool Double Hills to be proud of. And I hope that our commissioners and our town officials can share this pride. Um, I applaud the idea of a multi-use, but I, I would really like to see um, a way for everyone to work together with it and be able to keep that smooth surface for the Derby Brigade. And uh, thanks again for letting me speak. Thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And uh, we've uh, seen the Derby Brigade build up over all these years. And thank you for, for weighing in. Michael, do we have anyone else uh, for public comment? No one has raised their hand, sir. But if anyone who's attending would like to speak during public comment, if they'll just raise their hand on uh, the hand function, we'll be glad to include them in. Since it's unusual technology, we'll give everybody a moment or two to figure that out. If you're on a phone, it can be a little challenging. All right, Michael, if you haven't seen anybody else, else I guess we'll assume that is the size of it. Um, I know some, some emails came in from other uh, pickleballers and from other, um, uh, other derby folks. Uh, and inline skaters. Uh, I think I believe we could put a lot of those into the official minutes of this meeting. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All submitted email comments are included with the meeting materials and have also been forwarded to you all. Super. Right. So yeah, I, I think um, the the two. I guess the, I, first I should formally I guess close the uh, public comment if if there are no further folks for public comment. All right, and then the next item on our uh, agenda is um, response to public comment. So I was just going to say that uh, there's a lot of uh, good information from both groups that each of the other groups should know about. So I encourage the members of uh, all of these sports to, to get to know each other. And, and um, we do have, uh, as, as folks know, a, a dedicated committee that's been working for a couple of years called the Westside Recreation Group that meets intermittently, I think coming up shortly we'll get that date to everyone soon and um and hopefully we can keep on moving forward with uh, all the all the things that we would like to do as a town to support a wide variety of outdoor activities uh in the places that we have opportunities and with our our limited budgets but we'll, whatever we can do um you know we've, we've got folks that play um competitive frisbee golf and we've got folks that use our big turf fields and We've got skateboarders and, and folks that jog and walk their dogs. We've got a dog park, it goes on and on. So we, we look forward to as many voices as we can get into these discussions about how we'd like to see Kill Devil Hills look in the future and, uh, and move in that direction. So thanks to everybody who not only spoke tonight but also folks that wrote in. And uh, we encourage everybody to check out the, the minutes of the meeting when those come out. Um, are there any other comments about public comment from uh, Fellow, my fellow board members. Uh, Mr. Mayor Terry Gray, I, I'd like to make a, uh, a comment uh, in response to public comment. Please uh, do. If I may. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Barber has indicated that the roller rink is underutilized. Um, my opinion is that the roller rink is highly utilized by not only the roller derby girls, but uh, my understanding other groups as well. Um, also, Mr. Garber makes note that there needs to be a place where KDH residents can play pickleball. 
And a very quick review of areas where pickleball can be clay, played in the area has been identified and they're as follows. At the youth center in KDH, there are six inside courts. There are four outside courts. At Dowdy Park, there is one court. The number of courts not indicated, but pickleball is able to be played at the following locations is the YMCA, Nags Head Elementary School, and the Kitty Hawk Elementary School. Um, also in the public comments, it was uh, uh, included a sheet uh, of a proposal from Carolina Court Works for prep work on six pickleball courts on the roller rink. I feel that the town manager or her designee uh, needs to contact Carolina Court Works and indicate that uh, Mr. Garber is not authorized to seek or execute contracts on behalf of the town, nor is he an agent for the town in any way. Um, I've on several occasions talked with Mr. Garber, and each time I've indicated that I felt the appropriate place to talk about this would be at the WRG. Um, and especially with the fact that our next area to survey will be the bomb track, which includes Aviation Park and, and so forth. Um, and um, unfortunately, due to the high increases of positive tests with COVID in the county, we've postponed our meetings at the present time. Hopefully, it'll, it'll be something we can do uh, in the future. Um, be that as it may, I want to point out that the town has a very comprehensive um, recreational uh, facility plan. Uh, and this plan was um, updated in 2004. Hopefully, uh, it'll be updated again when the WRG finishes uh, and we can do it again. But this is this plan has on it uh, a community planning collaborative uh, and um, it surveyed uh, all of the recreation facilities, uh, not just in the town of Kildable Hills, but in Dare County in general. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a pretty comprehensive plan. Um, it consists of five sections and includes nine exhibits, five maps and appendices. Um, the, the plan also includes several general recommendations which will assist the town to better manage and program resources and facilities. Continue the process of planning for existing and new facilities and site and identify and evaluate additional recreation opportunities as they emerge. Um, the town, uh, <laughs> You know, they do not have a parks and rec department. The town's role in providing recreational facilities has grown tremendously since it adopted the first recreational plan or facility plan in 1989. I remember that plan well. Uh, I was on the board then. Um, the, the town needs to utilize its resources wisely. And I think Mr. Mayor, you had mentioned that earlier and, and provide for its residents and visitors needs while not duplicating, but complementing the efforts, facilities, and programs of others. We can't do it all in KDH. We just don't have the budget to do it, and we don't have the manpower. Um, the, this effort was led by the town's special projects committee, uh, the, the plan, and assisted by the Kill Double Hills Planning Department. The committee's overall goal was to develop an updating plan, updated plan that will guide the provisions of recreational facilities and activities in KDH for the next 10 years. Um, the committee utilized public meetings to solicit input from the public and solicited and considered input from representatives from neighboring jurisdictions, private and quasi-public recreational facilities and program providers, and Dare County's parks and recreations. The Dare County Comprehensive Recs and Parks Master Plan uh, which is dated 2001, is summarized as it relates to existing and recommended recommend, uh, recreational facilities in the area of Dare County, including KDH. So Dare County has a very comprehensive plan as well. Um, and I, I'm not sure if Mr. Garber's had opportunity to look at uh, the county's plan or the town's plan for that matter. Uh, however, I would suggest that he take a look at that and uh, follow up with the county to see where they may be able to provide some sort of complex, uh, which I believe is what he's looking for. Um, due to the choice of Mr. Garber to opt out of the WRG offer, uh, and, and of course that's always on the table, he's certainly welcome to come there. Um, and his intent um, 
to bring the issue to the Board of Commissioners for a decision, my personal recommendation, and, and I would suggest that we direct staff to accommodate pickleball provisions on the tennis courts at Meekins Field. We have a couple of tennis courts over there. And, you know, from what I understand, it's, um, you know, it would be something that's pretty easy to do. Um, and that, that would be to adapt those tennis courts to be able to play uh, pickleball. And that would give them an opportunity in KDH. Um, that is my response. And I, I just felt like I needed to say that, Mayor. And I, I appreciate the board's indulgence in uh, allowing me the time to do that. Well, we really appreciate your, your insights and all your work with the uh, West Side Recreation Group over these past months and years. Uh, those are some good suggestions as well. We have uh, a pro project in the works and um, nothing is set in stone it's still set in, until it is set in stone, as they say. Um, I uh, have one further comment was that uh, it was nice to, to see the creativity being put forth on trying to find solutions where folks can work together. I, I do know that the, that the, uh, the Derby has their own requirements about how much space is needed on the outside of that court and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of technical details that would need to go into it, but uh, we do appreciate everybody participating in the process. Uh, it's a process and it takes time and, um, and we're really always great to, glad to have um, input from all of our citizens. Uh, were any other um, board members like to comment on public comment? Um, Mayor, just real quick, I'd like to just piggyback on what Terry said a little bit as far as the use of um, the rink. I would say um, several of the emails that I did get from um, the pickleball members, it, um, they refer to the lack of use um, of the rink. And I live just a couple blocks from there. So I'm super fortunate that I walk by there daily. Um, I take my daughter to the skate park often and, and it gets used. It really does. There's homeschool groups using it for rollerblading. There's, um, you know, it might not be in the times that people are seeing it being used. I know the Derby girls are there in the evenings, sometimes late in the evenings. Um, so just, I just wanted to point that out, that it, that it is getting used. Yes, and they've done a lot of volunteer work over the years, um, uh, upgrading it themselves and putting a lot of effort into it and uh, hosting events there that were good for the community and, and good for business and that sort of thing. So it's an ongoing discussion and we really, like I said, we appreciate all the voices that are coming in there. Um, BJ, Mr. Windley, either you guys wanna weigh in or, or we're ready to move on? I'll just... Um echo a lot of the thoughts that have already been shared. I like the idea that for Mr. Garber and his group of uh, pickleballists, the, the door is still open for the West Side group, and that really is a good forum to study this issue, give staff a chance to prepare something to present to that group and get a good informed recommendation you know, to move forward with. Right, really good point. And that goes for anybody who has any other desires for things they'd like to see in their town whether it's uh, underwater basket weaving or, or badminton, or I'm a real big fan of those, uh, what are those things called? The uh, pump tracks. Those pump look tracks. like a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah I, know there's, I know there's some folks out there who'd love to see a pump track. And if you ask them about it, they tell you all about it. Uh, so we, like I said, we, we uh, always love taking the opportunity. I'm sure that this is a big enough topic that the folks uh, writing for our local media outlets will probably mention it. So we hope that they will mention in, the, in those media pieces that we do want everybody in Killable Hills to, to weigh in. We're all in this together. We're all trying to make the town the best place that it can be and, and uh, keep everybody uh, as healthy as we can be in these challenging times, as we like to say. And, and um, Mayor, one, one other thing, Mayor, uh, just sure. so that uh, everybody's aware, the uh, West Side Recreation Group, we are a very uh, open meeting forum, uh, and yep. uh, we certainly welcome comments. Uh, from anyone and uh, participation from anyone. So anybody that wants to stop by and uh, see one of our meetings, they're certainly welcome to uh, make, make whatever comments they might have. Great point too. And Mr. Mayor, uh, if I may, I might as well chime in. I think everybody else has. So uh, I wanna say that Mr. Garber had me out uh, to Parks and Rec uh, facility, indoor facility to play a little pickleball um, it was my first time. I enjoyed it. Uh, I can see where it's a, a type of sport that unites and involves all age groups. It, it's a great equalizer in a way because, 
you know, a young, a young person can play with an older person. Um, and it doesn't really matter maybe even your age, uh, as to your skill level and your hand-eye coordination. So it's, you know, it's unique in that it has such a following from, from, um, you know, those 60 or old, over, and there isn't really much for that, but I do agree that, uh, you know, we have to be in, you know, keep in mind that Dare County has uh, obligations and plans to those uh, folks of the county in their Parks and Recreation Division, and um, and we don't want to duplicate their efforts. I'm always for a multi-use anything um, because I think it could be. I actually believe it could be used more or utilized more efficient efficiently that um, rink for sure. Um, from my experience and seeing it, you know, empty a lot, but, um, but, you know, if you can, if you can satisfy even more people with, with a, a simple change, then, um, then I think that's terrific. Of course, I know, know plenty of the ladies in the Derby Brigade personally. So, uh, I'm definitely not trying to, you know, suggest taking away their, um, recreation spot there, but, um, I'm all about creative ways to re, you know, redesign, repurpose, and make something uh, like that rink uh, maximize its efficiency and its value for the for the people of the town. So, also, I, I will also agree that the, the Mikas has those tennis courts, um, and they are um, they they are also not utilized. Probably, well, of course, lately they haven't been utilized. They haven't been touched, but they haven't been utilized so that that could be a spot to 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 even consider making more of a pickleball spot so there's a lot we have to talk about with meekins and and i certainly appreciate commissioner gray's uh committee and and how how well he's um run that committee so i would defer to them but uh you know i, I would like to say that pickleball does uh, has grown and it would satisfy a need to have um more courts they don't really have although there is some they they don't have a lot outdoor really good points uh we appreciate that insight for sure yeah it's great that you got to get out there and play i look forward to giving it a shot one of these days oh it's the great. derby girls keep offering to let me go roller rink with them but <laughs> I, I don't think i i don't think i have it in me <laughs> i might get on a skateboard once in a while but i don't know about those roller skates that seems well, much for me, but yeah, I'm, I'm super impressed with all the athleticism in both of these sports and all the sports that we see out. And it's great to hear people talking passionate about uh, Lee about what they're what they're into. And and I know that the West Side Recreation Group members are all listening and watching, and and uh, they appreciate that input put too. And I always hope folks will show up to their meetings. So this is the next best thing. So um, I think that covers everybody. We've had some comment on public comment. I don't want to keep um, our guest, uh, we've got several guests, but um, I know Bobby Outen is, his time is very valuable. He's a super busy guy. Um, are we putting him up on X or are we gonna do Mr. Combs first? I forgot what you said earlier. You said that we were gonna- Oh, uh, Mr. Mr. Combs is first. Okay, right, we're gonna put him next. Okay, let's, let's go to Mr. Combs then. You're muted, yeah, Jack. You're muted. Oh, the pesky you're mute got you again. Mayor, how do you pronounce my name? What did I say it wrong? I'm sorry. McCombs. M C O M B S. Yeah, too too many balls in the air right now. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Jack McCombs, 38 or 3118 Bay Drive. Uh, I'm an avid cyclist. I founded the OBX Silver Riders Bicycle uh, Group for seniors. I also raced a lot in both senior games and national level non-senior games. I began riding road bikes at age 65, which was 15 years ago here in the OBX. And I was very fortunate to be guided and equipped by Chip Callens of Outer Bikes Bicycle. I say fortunate as he and his employees emphasized safety. And I certainly needed that when I first rode a road bike. I have now ridden nearly 40,000 miles on my bikes with most coming on OBX roads. For the first 10 years or so, it was often a challenge riding on these roads. It was common to be harassed, 
items thrown at riders. We were cursed and sometimes motorists would deliberately pass as close as possible to frighten the cyclist. Over the past five years, this has completely changed. It's much safer riding on the roads and rarely are cyclists harassed. This reflects directly on the efforts of local municipal and county governments, our state government, the national government, and non-government organizations such as the Outer Banks Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Coalition, all of whom collectively emphasize bike safety and educating bike riders and motorists. However, recently a new danger to cyclists and the public has emerged, which is not a local phenomenon that has, as it's become a national issue. That is e-bikes ridden by, ridden by inexperienced riders at two face fast speeds. E-bikes are a wonderful addition to our local and national culture. They have enabled more people to get outside for longer periods involving a healthy activity, provides a very convenient and less costly method of transportation without polluting the environment. There are different classes of e-bikes that you can easily understand by searching the internet, but I just want to talk about three general uh, categories. The first is pedal assist with low wattage motors. The motors disengages if pedaling action stops. Top speed is 20 miles an hour. Pedal assist with throttle. Some disengage when pedaling stops, but others require the cyclist to proactively disengage the throttle. Top speeds are 20 to 28. And then there's the throttle only. And this depends on what the manufacturer does with the bike and what cyclists themselves do with it. Uh, those bikes can go over 40 mile an hour. Uh, Outer Banks Bicycle only sells category one uh, e-bikes and does so with a lot of safety information. Most e-bikes in the OBX are, are these bikes, but by my personal observation, we're beginning to see more of the other categories. These are the problems I'm mostly concerned with. And the same problems have been highlighted in various US publications and media outlets. Because many uh, e-bike riders are leaving their slow recreational bikes for e-bikes, they are unaware and uneducated how to safely ride a much faster bike, 18, 20 miles per hour and even faster. They imperil themselves and since e-bikes are so quiet, the e-bike rider while on multi-use pass, approaching other users from the rear that is walkers, skateboarders, mom and dads, children, without the knowledge of the other users who only learn of the presence of the e-biker as they are being passed, as the e-bike rider does not know enough to warn people that they're approaching, which is a common court, uh, courtesy that nearly all road bikers learn early in their road biking. This is often very startling and creates a great danger to both the other users and the cyclists when the other user veers from their expected course. There are North Carolina laws that address some of the issues of e-bike cycling, which are available at NCDOT. For example, e-bikes, where e-bikes can be ridden, the power of the motor, age restrictions, each rider, you have to be above the age of 16. All this information is available via the internet. My recommendation for you is to encourage the continued use of e-bikes, but also to post signs at frequent intervals along all multi-use paths, advising e-bike riders to announce their presence to other users, establish a speed limit you certainly don't want people doing 20 mile an hour on a multi-use path and advise people to use helmets 
Helmets are not required, but certainly it's wise advice. I also recommend that you coordinate whatever actions you decide to initiate with the public as you always do, but also with other local governments. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much for that. You are, you're so very right. New technology is always um, has a, a learning curve and, and um, safety is in all of the, the forefront of all of our minds. And uh, we will adapt and we'll definitely pass on these recommendations to, to the folks that are planning out signage and that sort of thing to see uh, where there might be opportunities. Um, they are something to see. I've got an uncle who swears by his, he loves it. Um, gets all around DC on the thing. I just got an electric skateboard. I think it goes 28 miles an hour. It's terrifying. Um, but anyway, good fun. The world is changing in all sorts of ways we can't predict. Um, but I really appreciate your uh, participation in this discussion and, and all the, the uh, many years of experience you bring to the conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time and thinking of others in this way. We really appreciate it. Do Mayor, I'd like to um, just, just John uh, Winley. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, John Winley speaking. Uh, just like to thank uh, Mr. McCon for such a uh, well-researched presentation. Uh, really shared a lot of quality information, and I uh, very much support all the recommendations you made to our board. And hopefully, we can move forward in making some of those safety issues happen. Could have said it better myself. Any other board members like to make a comment on the presentation? That that must have been what uh, Terry Gray here. That must have been what came up behind me the other day. Uh, it was a guy on a three wheel bicycle. I was running about thirty five, and he come up behind me and passed me. Uh, so that that must have been an e bike, huh, Jack? Probably. They yeah. will do forty if you get the right one. Yeah. Okay. Well, great presentation. Thank you so much. And um, Commissioner McAvoy here, uh, Mr. McCombs, I, I appreciate that as well. And I wanted to say that as a person who uses those multi-use paths, uh, it's certainly very hard to judge these uh, bicycles. They look like um, any other bicycle and then they're up on you in, in no time. And uh, it's certainly, um, it, to me, they don't really have any place on the multi-use path at that speed. Um, you know, it's, it's really dangerous. So, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of discussion nationally about, about these bikes, but, you know, I know I wouldn't ride my bike. I can pedal at 20 miles an hour. I wouldn't ride my bike on the multi-use path at 20 miles an hour. So, um, you know, I, I think it is a, it is something that needs to be addressed and it will come up more and more as they get more popular. So. Good point. Good points all about, yeah, right, you wouldn't even ride a pedal bike that fast. That makes sense. It's just dangerous to have that speed when you've got not just bikes and when you're off of the roadway. Um, yeah. And, and I think the public doesn't really generally know, uh, you know what the rules are. And if you think, hey, what's wrong with this? Uh, the only way we can sort of educate folks is uh, public uh, information campaigns. Um, and there's all sorts of ways you can do that. And then, of course, signage. We try to keep signage to a minimum at the same time, but Trying to balance all those uh, those needs out for safety versus uh, clutter to the eyeballs, uh, we'll, we will definitely put our thinking caps on it and, and put it to some smart people who think about these things all the time and see what we can learn about uh, the best ways forward. So, I think you've you've got uh, support among the board. Uh, I'm sure that Ivy's in the same camp, and uh, we we will not uh, drop the ball on this. We'll keep keep moving it forward. If there's nothing else on this topic, we we can move on to uh, um, Mr. Alton. Great, <clears throat> thanks for having me. Good good to see you. I I think I I know most of you, um, some longer than others. Some go like way back. That'd be you, Terry. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to be back in Kill Devil in front of Kill Devil Hills. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about beach nourishment and our current plans. Um, for some of you, I mean, the mayor is aware of what we're talking about. Um, I think the town attorney has heard this at least once, and, and I've talked with Debbie. Um, 
And some of you would know anyway, others may not be as familiar with beach nourishment and what we've done up to date mm -hmm. and where we're headed. And so this will clue, give you clues in, tell you what we're doing, tell you what we're thinking. And it's, and it's more to elicit some feedback from you with our future plans um, to be sure as we plan going forward, we didn't miss something. We didn't do something or, or, or propose to do things that may somehow uh, negatively impact the town. We want to be aware of anything like that. So we're really seeking feedback as we go through to, to allocate our funds going forward. Um, since its inception in the beach nourishment, since we started doing beach nourishment, the county's had um, two cents of the occupancy tax that is dedicated solely to beach nourishment. It cannot be used by, for anything else, and that's by statute. And the county's philosophy has been to use those dollars to put as much sand on beaches anywhere in their county that needs sand. Um, there has been no effort to try to allocate it per town or anything like that. Um, there hadn't been, we didn't do Nags Head and then save a bunch of money hoping that another town might do it. Um, we, we just, as we had problems, we tried to address them um, we addressed all of our problems with input from all of the towns. There wasn't a time that we spent money out of the fund as we planned that we didn't go to the other towns and say, what are your plans? What do you want? Because again, we didn't want to spend every dollar we had, say, at Nags Head and then know that Kill Devil Hills was about to do something and then didn't have enough money to do it. And so when we did the first plan in Nags Head, uh, we ask all the towns, anybody got beach nourishment on the books? Where are you? Are you going to do it? And pretty much nobody was interested. And so we funded Nags Head and we basically negotiated a number, really not based on anything, but the negotiation to fund their program to make it go. And I believe that on the day that project was finished or the next day, we had Hurricane Irene and and Irene, we immediately went out on the beach to see, oh my gosh, what happened? We just spent all this money and the beach was beautiful. Uh, and the water didn't come over and the water didn't damage anything on the ocean front. There was no water on Highway 12. Um, and the project did exactly what it was supposed to do. Uh, and it was a really good test. And I think based on that, the other towns began thinking, well, maybe this is something that we ought to be doing. And Kill Devil Hills and Duck began looking at it and said, we want to do this too. And so uh, at the same time that we were doing that, we were looking at Kitty Hawk and Kitty Hawk was having problems with oceanfront run over closing Highway 12 and also flooding between the highways. Um, their oceanfront tax base isn't nearly as valuable or as vibrant as it is in Kill Devil Hills or in Duck. Uh, but the problems they were having between the highways were real and, and that water was also in a large storm going all the way out and closing 158. And so there was something needed to be done there too. And so all three of those towns gathered together, we worked together um, and we spent more than a year trying to come up with a way to fund all of those projects. Um, we looked at, could we do it, you know, take Nags Head, could we do it with the same per cubic yard? Could we do it with the same per foot? And the answer is we could not. And it, any formula that we used that was trying to do it that way was unfair. Um, it, Kitty Hawk had little money and little tax base. And so anything that we did would prevent us from doing anything in Kitty Hawk. On the other hand, Kill Devil Hills had a very large tax base and anything we did there, um, if we tried to make them pay like other towns pay, then it unfairly penalized them for their large tax base. And so we really didn't do that either. And so as we worked through it, we just worked through trying to find a fair way to do it. And to the credit of the towns and the county leaders, everybody agreed we needed to get this done. How do we do it? And so we massaged tax rates. We did things until everybody was kind of on board and we got relatively the same rates, but not really. Um, and so some town, Kitty Hawk got more proportionately than say Duck did or Kill Devil Hills did because they could afford more. They could afford less and, and the towns could afford more. Um, we didn't want to put a burden on any of the towns greater than 
you know, the burdens in any other towns. And I think that kind of equaled out among the towns over time. And so, again, everybody understood that you couldn't let do a great project in Kill Devil Hills and do a great project in Duck and then leave Kitty Hawk sitting because when um, the weather channel comes down, they're not going to go to the beautiful beaches in Kill Devil Hills. They're going to go to Kitty Hawk where the house is falling in the water and say, oh my God, what a catastrophe. And that's terrible for our economy, terrible, terrible for our industry and, and is what we were trying to avoid. And the leaders in the towns all got that. And so we're able to come to agreement and, and we did what we did there to, to get everybody project. Um, with that said, we knew going into the future, we had to plan. And so we began modeling our revenue sources, our future costs and all those kind of things. And we're at model, I think I'm looking on my desk here, model 26G uh, of the models that we've done over the years, trying to make sure we keep up with the revenues, we keep the projections right. Um, our philosophy has been for any project that we do, we want to project out funds that would allow us to do the maintenance on five-year intervals. Um, it didn't make a lot of sense to us or to the towns to invest millions of dollars in a beach nourishment project if there was no prospect of keeping it maintained into the future. And so our philosophy is we don't do any new projects to the detriment of old projects, and we don't um, do any projects that would eat into the maintenance fund that keeps the future, the old projects going into the future. And we've held by that and plan to hold by that as we go forward. To leverage these funds, we and some of the towns as well borrowed money on short term. We borrowed on five-year intervals, real short-term lending, and that allows us to pay all the cost up front, but pay it back over five years, which allows us to stretch the fund further and get more sand on the beach, which again is our philosophy um, to do that. And so we, we borrow money on those five year increments. Um, the plan models that, uh, the plan models the future costs, the plan has some assumptions built in it for growth, it has some assumptions built in it for uh, cost increases. And, and those assumptions are all based on what your consultants and the other consultants who've done projects have told us and, and we build those in. Um, I believe you all use Doug Carter and Associates as your financial advisors. We do as well. They're the ones that built the model for us. Uh, and every time one of our parameters change, we run the model again to see what's that going to do? What's the impact of a decision that we might want to make? And how does that impact what we've already done? Um, we also keep one year's worth of debt service uh, in the bank. Um, our concern would be that if we had a storm in May or June that wiped out a whole season, that debt service payment for that year that we borrowed from one of these beach nourishment projects is gonna come due. And we need to have money available to pay that. And we borrow five-year intervals for all of the town's projects. And so we need to have funds there to repay that debt um, should we have something happen early in a season like that. So with those assumptions in place over time, <clears throat> the fund has grown. We've been doing what I just described. And we have about today, eight and a half million dollars of excess money, if you will, in the fund. And that's, when I say excess, that's money that's available to build a project somewhere. And we now have two program, two communities that need to use that money. Uh, the town of Southern Shores needs to do a project in their town. And down in Avon, they need to do a project in Avon as well. Um, obviously, eight and a half million dollars isn't enough money to do two, eight, four, 11 to 14 million, 11 to 16 million dollar projects. And so we've been working since way back in the summer trying to figure out how in the world are we going to solve the two problems we have here, one in Avon and one uh, in Southern Shores with only eight and a half million dollars to contribute to whatever those communities want to do. Um, we got lucky, I suppose, and, or fortuitous in that there was no way we could do that. We, we had been to the legislature. Uh, we went to them several times. Uh, the folks on Avon went to the legislature several times, all trying to generate a beach nourishment fund that would help fund the projects and a recurring fund, because once again, if you don't have recurring money, then it's kind of 
silly to invest at one time with no prospect of doing it again. And so we hadn't yet been able to get any traction at the legislature. Uh, we've been working on it. Um, you're, the some of the towns, I think, had also been to the legislature similarly, and towns in other areas and counties that do beach nourishment in the state have too. But to date, there is no dedicated beach nourishment fund from the state. So I said we got for lucky and about a month ago or maybe two months ago, the towns and the county each got grants from the state of about $1.4 million. And those were grants that can only be used for beach nourishment. They, you can't use them for anything else and they aren't attributable to any particular project. So you're not locked in to spending them on this project or that project. When we began running the numbers, we looked at what do we need to do to give each town what they expect um, with regard to their maintenance that's coming up in 2022. And what we found was, was that if we reduced the county's contribution to the town's maintenance project by projects for all the towns by that $1.4 million, took the county's $1.4 million and took Southern Shores that doesn't have a project, they're $1.4 million and put all that in the fund. And then the count, the towns presumably we could use the, the grant money that they receive to pay <clears throat> the reduction in the funds that the county is proposing. Each of the towns could have exactly the project that the maintenance required and called for under the plan before we ever knew about any of these grants. And it would result in enough money with the Dare County money and the Dare County borrowing, and with about a 40 cent tax increase in Avon to do both projects. Um, now that's a pretty big hike in Avon and we recognize that. But in order to make this work, that was the only, these are the only options that we had. Otherwise, we can't do these two projects. There's not enough money in the system um, to do those projects. Um, we, we look at Avon and that big tax hike, that 40 cent on top of our 42 cent, I think, tax rate means they're paying about 82 cent. That's probably on par with what Nags Head's tax rate, combined tax rates are. That's probably on par with what Kill Double Hills is combined tax with the county, town, and beach nourishment taxes. So they would be paying about the same as most of the other places that have beach nourishment, even with that large number. Um, and, and it works. It, it, fulfills the county's philosophy to get all the sand on the beaches throughout the county that we can while not doing anything to the detriment of the current projects and make sure that we can maintain those. Uh, we ran the models using that. It doesn't impair our ability to do the future maintenance on the current projects or these two new proposed projects. We would have enough money over time to do those. So the towns are whole in the sense that they get the projects they expected and we're able to put sand on multiple miles of other beaches that are in desperate need. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Avon lately, but there's ocean lapping into swimming pools. And every time we have a good nor'easter, we have water over Highway 12, we're making it impassable. And so we've got to do something down there somehow to um, stop the flooding of that road to make it impassable because that's dangerous uh, and to protect that area. And so that's what we're proposing to do. Um, I don't know whether anyone had other plans for that $1.4 million. I'm sure you could always find something to do with it. And I understand that. But in order for us to do what we need to do, in order for us to do what our philosophy is, that is to put sand on as many beaches as possible without doing anything to the detriment of current projects. This is something that works. It doesn't Again, it doesn't do anything to the detriment of the town's projects and it allows us to do some things that are desperately needed. And so that is the direction that we're going. Um, you all are the last town. I've met with all of the other towns similar to this, either in person or on a, a Zoom call and went through this last week with, with those towns. Um, everybody seems to be on board so far. We don't have, we. there's nothing that's come up that we weren't aware of or any other things that we need to bake into our assumptions. But again, we wanted to be sure that all of our stakeholders, and you all are certainly one of them, that we had talked to them 
Um, we're going to have some public hearings down in Avon or by Zoom or somehow we're working on how to do something that large now. But we need to hear from them as a stakeholder as well because we want to be sure we're on board with what they want and, and that we're following the will and the, the requests that we've had from down there. Uh, and so we're going through this process orderly. Um, at our board meeting on Monday, uh, we're going to probably, we've got on the agenda the contract with our consultants to proceed with the permitting and all that for the Avon project. We can't wait until we've made a final decision. And so we've told them to go ahead and start if we decide not to do Avon because the political will is not there after we have our public hearings and we'll pay them for the work that they've done and we'll stop the project. But for now, we're proceeding as if those are gonna move forward subject to whatever comes out of those public hearings. And Avon, and subject to whatever I hear from you all. I mean, I, you all don't have to vote. I'm not looking for a motion. The decision is a decision of the Board of Commissioners, but we certainly want your input. We want your feedback and we want your thoughts. And if you have better ideas or other ideas, that would be great because, you know, we've, we've worked really hard trying to come up with something, but I can't promise you it's the only way. There's always somebody that knows more, has better ideas. If there are, we want to hear them. So, I'll stop talking and leave it at that and, and then answer any questions that any of you have and, and go from there. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, great presentation. There's so many facets to this that it's hard to uh, keep them all and you you do a masterful job of keeping them all uh, making sense in, in plain language everybody can understand. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated piece of math and it's a complicated pro problem that or a challenge that our whole area faces together as a, as a group um, well, your example about where the Weather Channel sets up their camera is the perfect <laughs> illustration of that. Um, you know, the, the folks in Pennsylvania don't, don't always know one part of the Outer Banks from the other. Um, uh, that said, I do have the uh, advantage of having uh, heard, heard about this some time ago, and of course it's been written about in, in The Voice and a few other places online uh, as, the, as Bobby's made these presentations in, in other towns. Um, my two cents I might add to a otherwise perfect presentation was that um, the decisions that were made about how much Kildeville Hills taxpayers would put towards this project were made with a, a previous board um, a good while ago uh, because these things take years to plan and, uh, and, and our taxpayers contribution to the project that's, that's going to happen next uh, is not going to change. Um, and when you look farther down the road, um, the, the formulas are, are covering the, the same arrangement that had been made about the, the, the re-nourishment of the coming back and doing the maintenance. Um, so that's not an issue. Um, but if you have any questions for Bobby, I definitely want you to ask them and, and uh, I'd like to hear just a little bit about what everybody feels about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks involved in this discussion. Mayor Terry Gray, uh, my my big uh, biggest concern would be the fact that uh, Bobby, you indicated that the uh, maintenance aspect of uh, of the program would not be affected. Correct? We'd still uh, have that covered. Correct. Our 2022 project that we're all working on right now doesn't change at all by this. Okay. Um, you weren't counting on this money for that project to start with, and it's not. It wasn't factored into the formula as we plan those projects, you know, a year or two ago and as the permitting has been done. So they're, they're gonna continue on just as planned. Okay, that, that would be my, my big concern, Mayor, and, and I'm satisfied with that. Right, I had the same thought too earlier and uh, you're getting exactly where I got. It makes sense once you get all the pieces in place. Right. Ms. Ingram, anybody else? Um, thoughts, questions? Um, I just I do have one question as, in terms of the maintenance again, um, adding in Avon and Southern Shores, knowing that they will need maintenance in the future. I'm sort of thinking 15 years down the line, are, are we going to get in this situation where sort of now there's more people that need to be maintained and more, you know, so, adding in well, those projects? The answer is when, if, when we, if we do, Southern Shores, we have eight and a half million dollars to do a project right now, as I said, and when that money is gone, it'll be a long time 
before yeah. we can do any new projects. That will pretty much exhaust the fund as we cook in the maintenance, cook in the growth and all that. Um, it would not be true and it wouldn't be fair to tell you all that forever nothing is going to change or no tax rate is going to change and all that because there's going to come a time when beach nourishment is going to cost more. And I don't know when that is, but the sand's going to be further away. The cost of fuel in a ship is going to go up. You know, those things, the normal stuff we've built into that on whatever as best it can be projected by the experts. But should any of those assumptions change and should we one day use up all of the sand source and have to go 100 miles offshore, then, then everything changes and, and the model doesn't work any good. And, and that's true with any model. If any of your assumptions change, then you do it. But the assumptions are made on the best information that we have. We project them out five years as working models and 10 years just to know you can't, you know, it's hard to project anything 10 years, but we've, we've run it out 10 years just to see what it looks like uh, under the current assumptions. And then as those assumptions change, we build it back in. Um, there would be a little bit of money in the project, like in, two, in the fund in about 2028, there wouldn't be enough to do a project, but there'd be some, I'll call it cushion a little bit, not, huge, a few million dollars. Uh, that's a lot of money, but it's nothing in terms of beach nourishment. It doesn't do much for a beach nourishment project. But so that's how it works. Um, so I, I'm not trying to represent that forever. It's going to be just like it is now, but for the foreseeable for this project, it is. And we believe for the next maintenance cycle, it is. And if the model holds true for the, the maintenance cycle after that, we're good as well. And we just haven't run it past that far yet. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And just for folks who aren't up on all these cycles, when you say uh, maintenance cycles, they're they're not a hard number because it depends on what happens in the interim. But that's a five to seven year design thing. Is do I have that right? We've used five years, and those those have changed. I mean, Nags Head went longer than five. Theirs lasted longer than they anticipated, and so it went longer. When they go longer, it helps the fund. It helps the fund grow, and it's good uh, when it goes longer. Um, we've shortened some too to try to make it match up with FEMA money because we get FEMA money when we get damages. And so maybe a project that we might would have done in 2023, we're doing it in 2022 to make it fit with FEMA requirements or other towns requirements because it, you know, we're trying to work together. We, we combine these town projects because we save so much money with mobilization when we do them all as one. And so Dare County enters the contract with the builder for all the towns and then the towns pay their share and we, and we handle the money and pay the, the contractor. And then our MOU says you handle all the people. So you get all the phone calls and we handle all the logistics and, and that has worked well. And it has saved us millions of dollars that stay in the fund and allow this thing to work. And so, you know, if, if Duck and Kitty Hawk needed a, a renourishment in Kill Double Hills was a year away. We might would do Kill Double Hills a year early just because it saves Kill Double Hills so much money than, than standing alone. If we had one that needed it and two that didn't, we might try to hold off on the one two years to make it job with the other again for the same reason. And we just play with those things and the consultants talk about it and we try to balance it to make it as economical as possible. And that's not, I say us, we're not making those, all those, I mean, there's, us means the county and the towns. We're doing this together. Right, and, and as a community of towns and, and the county, we've gone from not knowing how to do this to being pretty good at it over the last 20 years. Uh, and hopefully we keep getting better at it. And, and I'll just have to say the cooperation among the town leadership from the mayors and the commissioners to the managers has been unbelievable. I mean, we do a lot of things together, but this is the, without a doubt, the best, with the most consequences and the most money involved and probably is, is as smooth as anything that we do. So and that does not happen up and down the coast. <laughs> There's some other places where it doesn't go as smoothly, I'm sure. Um, uh, who have we not heard from? Anybody else would like, anybody else like to ask a question or make a comment? Oh, uh, John Windley here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Alton, for such a comprehensive explanation of a big issue in a way that 
you know, makes me understand it a lot better. I'm sure folks who are uh, watching this online uh, feel the same way. Um, and that's really all I got to say. Just very nice job, sir. Thank you. Is that everybody? Did BJ? Well, I can't remember. Just yes, I would agree. Thank you. I'm, I'm learning uh, about this as we as we go here. So I appreciate that presentation, uh, Mr. Outen. And uh, I think, um, you know, I'm educating myself so I can ask the appropriate questions um, being new to the board. So uh, I don't have anything at this time, but thank you. Uh, one, Mayor, if you may, I will say yes. that if you all go back and start thinking about this and you have a question or you have a concern or you hear from a constituent, call me. Um, I'm pretty accessible. I'm fairly easy to get to. If you don't get me on the phone, I'll call you back and, and I'm glad to answer any questions that you have and, and try to help you. Um, our goal is to, again, get as much sand on these beaches as we can. Uh, we're not playing favorites. We just want to make sure all of our beaches look nice and we're trying to be good stewards and, and stretch these dollars as far as we can. So we'll, we'll answer any questions, help you, and certainly are open to any ideas that you have as well. So just call me and I'm glad to talk to you and talk through it. And if you come up with something good, we'll try to get it out there and get it done. That sounds good. Yeah, great invitation. Well, thanks again on behalf of the whole board for, for taking the time and, uh, and putting the presentation together. I know it's been a lot of your time to get it around here and it's a, it's a great project. And we're glad to, to be part of it. And of course, that's not how, how we thought it would go, but when you know, I work down in Salvo and I get to Avon on a pretty regular basis, it's a, it's a pretty dire circumstance down there. The water's on the road a uh, dozen plus times a year. Um, and sometimes it just stays for days and days. Um, it's uh, you know, P Island's got its own problems. That's that's another story. But uh, the part that we have some control over, hopefully, we can get some sand on those beaches sooner rather than later. So, like you said, we're all in this together. We we don't need any, need any horrifying scenes from the middle of Avon uh, uh, anytime. So, thanks for all you do, and uh, thanks for taking the time. And uh, we will move on. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Good night. Good night. All right, so uh, that is it for introductions and presentations. We're moving on to old business. Uh, we have a proposed amendment. Uh, op we're going to talk about proposed amendment options for Chapter 153 zoning uh, regarding duplexes and accessory dwelling units. Um, I think Cameron and Meredith uh, will lead us off here. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. This is Meredith Guns, Planning Director, talking to you. Um, at the last meeting, the, the board discussed several housing options and I broke them into two categories because they're two very different um, things to talk about and thought it, it would be easier to, to keep them separated. The first one we talked about was um, changing the lot size for a duplex. Um, spent a lot of time on, on what areas the lots should be reduced to 15,000 square feet versus the required 20,000 square feet. And if I understood correctly, and that's why I'm bringing it back to you to make sure I did understand correctly, the board wanted to reduce the lot size for duplexes to 15,000 square feet in those zones which currently allow multifamily to be located on lots of 15,000 square feet, which includes the residential high, commercial, light industrial two, and light industrial one zoning districts. So my memorandum outlines a very simple amendment that would go into each one of those sections and it would simply change the lot size from 2,000 to 5,000 square feet for duplexes in those zones. It would not change it for the maritime forest, the residential low, or the ocean impact residential zone. And all I'm looking for is, is to make sure that I understood you guys correctly so that this can go to the planning board for um, formal recommendation to you guys for public hearing. That's how I recall it. Uh, everybody else, is that, that's how you remember it from the previous meeting? Yes, Commissioner Lindley here. And uh, I think this is a really accurate uh, representation of what we discussed last time. Yes, same Here's for me. Great. I, think, I think that's all of us. Right? Yes, I, I recall that as well. Okay, 
Great. Well, thank you for clarifying that and making sure we got it in writing. And, and now you can go ahead with the work to get it set for the planning department to take a look at it at their next meeting. Um, yes, item sir. B is the accessory, accessory dwelling units. We talked about that at length at the last meeting as well. And I this see you put together some definitions and things. So we'll, we'll get into that. Go ahead. Yeah, this, this one was a little more complicated and that's why I thought separating it from duplexes would be a little bit easier. Um, the, the board directed staff to develop some regulations on permitting accessory dwelling units. Um, you had seen several um, accessory dwelling unit regulations from Duck, um, Kitty Hawk and Dare County and had sort of picked out some, some specific things that you liked. I tried to put that into an amendment. The thing that is a little bit fuzzy um, from reviewing all the, the minutes and everything was what zones the board wanted to allow accessory dwelling units. What staff has proposed is very similar to the duplexes um, is commercial, the commercial and the two light industrial zones. In your packet, you were included a zoning map to show you exactly where that would be located. Um, and I'll go over quickly what the regulations um, that, that I um, put together for y'all to review. One was a de definition of accessory dwelling unit, um, which requires it to be on one parcel in conjunction with the principal single family dwelling, subordinate in floor plan bulk and height of the principal. Um, accessory dwelling unit may be included as part of the principal single family dwelling unit attached to the principal or, uh, entirely detached, uh, <clears throat> it specifically prohibits the use of motorhomes, campers, and travel trailers as an accessory dwelling unit. The regulations that were set out, set out were um, from the discussion of the board, and if I missed one, please let me know. Um, I believe the board agreed that the accessory dwelling units could only be located on property containing one single family detached dwelling um, didn't want it on a multi-family site or a commercial site at this time. It might be something you looked at in the future. Uh, <clears throat> no more than one per residential lot. They can't be more than 50% um, living area of the primary dwelling or 800 square feet, whichever's less. There's a lot of discussion about that. And I think that's what we came down to. They must comply with all applicable setbacks and um, cannot extend into the front yard. They must be properly permitted, inspected, and comply with all standards of the North Carolina Building Code, code and the Kildall Hills Town Code, which includes our flood ordinance. Um, the owner must obtain a permit from environmental health for the septic, um, and it would have to be parked. I put a amendment to the parking ordinance that would require one parking space per accessory dwelling unit plus one space for every bedroom over one. Um, just to clarify that right now, single family is two spaces minimum with an additional space for every bedroom over two. Um, so this is a little bit less of a parking requirement, but um, I think it still would work uh, well with what they're being used for. It again, reiterates that recreational vehicles, travel trailers and manufacturing homes cannot be approved as accessory dwellings. And it also finally says that they cannot be subdivided or segregated in ownership, meaning you can't condominiumize them from the principal dwelling unit. Um, a couple of the other towns required things to be put into the register of deeds. Uh, I, I did not put that in here. I don't think it's necessary. Um, if you say it can't be subdivided, you have to get a subdivision permit from the town. Um, so we should be, uh, we, we obviously just wouldn't approve that because it wouldn't meet our, our town code. Uh, again, there's not a minimum lot size. Um, through the discussion with the board, it became clear that if someone could fit an accessory dwelling unit on their property and meet all the, the health department and setback requirements, then they should be able to utilize their space and have a minimum lot size for that. Um, so there's no minimum lot size for in this in this proposed regulation. And with that, I will 
ask the board if I missed anything or if you have any questions about what I have written. Meredith, John Winley here. I think that uh, you guys really did a fine job here. It really hit all the points we talked about and uh, I'm comfortable uh, moving this forward through the process. Uh, Terry Gray here. Uh, Meredith, I think you nailed it. Thank you. This is Ivy. I would agree. Everything we talked about, I, I saw in here. So thank you very much. Yeah, you've really distilled down uh, what was a pretty complex conversation. I think you got all the pieces in there. Um, you know, I, I could push and pull on corners of it, but I, I think that this is really getting us where we need to get. And it, it uh, because it doesn't have that size limitation, it basically, I think, helps us not have houses get bulldozed and giant houses get built. It gives another option for people to um, basically offer housing for folks at an affordable price because it's not you know taking up a whole lot and uh, it helps people stay in those homes and other people afford homes that other eyes wouldn't want because they have the income um, so it's doing all the things that we hope to do when we started the discussions about this and I, I'm sure that the um, very positive that the planning board will think uh, likewise so we look forward to sending it their way uh, Mr. Mayor one one quick uh, clarification just mm -hmm. to make sure from what I got from the previous discussion, the board wanted this to be included in the commercial light industrial one and light industrial two zoning districts, which currently allow multifamily dwellings, warehouse, single family and duplex, as well as mobile homes. Is that right? I think, is that I think with, correct? The, with the caveat of for now, right? <laughs> so yeah, yes, sir. for now, that's where we're going, I think. And that I would think. that would again exclude the ocean impact residential zone, the residential low zone and the maritime forest. Yes, right. and res and the residential high. Correct, and residential high for now. Yes, so it right. would be in our in our highest use districts at, at first. Is that at what, first? Yeah, is well, that, that, the, that exactly. That's kind of a, a good test bed there, and and that there are opportunities there. We'll get to see how that plays out, and if it goes well, we might see more demand for it from from other um, constituents. Uh, if they see it going well. So I think that's a, it's a great way to start without um, upsetting the apple cart along the way. Thank you. And we'll get it to the planning board um, maybe this month. Super, super. Well, Thank thanks you. again for all your hard work on it. I know that it was a lot to, uh, to distill down and you did a great job putting it together that way. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, now we're moving on to new business. We have a site plan before us for 709 North Virginia Dare Trail. That's the OIR, Ocean Impact Residential Zone of a proposed cluster home development with 14 single family dwellings. And um, we, we talked about this at the last meeting. We've also, it's also been through the, the planning board and the planning board has um, made a recommendation to, to move it forward and um, had all of their um, concerns uh, addressed if I'm understanding that correctly, is that right? Good evening, Mayor and Board. This is Cameron Ray, Planning Department. And you are correct, the Planning Board reviewed this on December 15th, and they did forward to the board recommending approval with no conditions. Gotcha, yeah, it was great to see it all up close. You know, we talked about it sort of in general terms, but to see the actual engineered drawings, it's an impressive bit of engineering, what they've done there with the stormwater system is very complex and really well designed. and um, they've really maximized it in all the ways that you would expect a, a smart plan to, to do so. Um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's going to be something different in the town and, and it's something that we have worked for for many years to try to get to a point where we have other opportunities for developers other than building gigantic McMansions as we uh, disparagingly say to call them. Um, because there, there's not a lot of taste for that among the local population is despite their, um, their popularity among investors and, and, and possibly the public. But uh, this is a great, uh, a great uh, thing to see that someone has taken in the opportunity um, so quickly after we made those changes to the, to the code, uh, was it last fall, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that said, are, are there any other comments anybody would like to make about the plan now that you've seen all the details? Mayor Cameron Reagan, real quick, just to yeah. um, let you know, 
the applicant or the designing engineer, Mike Robinson is on here as a panelist. So if anybody does have any particular questions regarding design, um, it, we can definitely have him answer any or we can help you out. So <laughs> let us know if you do have any questions. That's, that's fantastic. Thanks for being here, Mr. Robbins. Appreciate it. No problem. I just wanted to say that, uh, Mayor Terry Gray, I just wanted to say that it was good to see the sprinklers. Yep. Um, I think that's a big safety feature, and uh, I was excited to see that. Right, right. And I, you know, I read through all the, the, all the <laughs> correspondence back and forth getting to that point. Um, the, the lot is huge. It's su super deep. And, um, uh, but it has that sort of T at the end to turn around. And my understanding is that the T is not long enough to allow the apparatus to, to turn around. And that's what kicked the state requirement for sprinkling Correct. in there. So uh, it is a great thing to see. It'll be a very safe, uh, nice safety thing that you don't have to worry about, worry about that and, uh, and know that, that um, they have that protection. Any other questions for, for the engineer or any other thoughts about the project? Uh, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of swimming pools. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of swimming pools. <laughs> <laughs> Some high density swimming pool swimming going on there. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it'll, be, it'll be fun to see it in use. All right, with, uh, if there are no other comments, um, I guess we are looking for a motion to approve. Would anyone like to make that motion? Mayor John Lee here. I will uh, make a motion of approval that we approve the site plan for 709 North Virginia Delta Trail Ocean Impact Residential Zone proposed cluster home development as presented. Super, we and have, uh, oh, excuse me, we have, a, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second that motion, Commissioner McAvoy here. Got a, a, a motion and a second from Mr. McAvoy. Uh, do I hear any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote of uh, Mr. McAvoy and Mr. Winley in the affirmative. Uh, Ms. Ingram, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Mr. Gray, how do you vote? Yes, sir. And I am in the affirmative as well. The project moves forward unanimously. Thank you guys for considering it. And, and uh, again, thanks to Mr. Robbins for being here and for staff for, uh, I know it was a lengthy process going through uh, this, this, uh, this new opportunity in the town and thanks for all your hard work uh, working with the developer to to get the project uh, where it needed to be so we could be here at this moment. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll stand by Cameron for uh, in case there's any questions about Bermuda Bay. So, Yes, that's where we're headed next. So moving on, we are. Oh, nope, that's not. Uh, well, that's not next. No. That's in. Uh, that's in the. Uh, why can't I think of the word? Yes. Later on. Consent agenda. Consent agenda. There's the word I'm looking for. Gosh, couldn't get the word out of my head. All right. So having gotten through new business one, we're on to new business two. We have received uh, an offer for purchase on the, the town owned property down at the south end on the on the bypass there. And we're going to be considering a resolution offer authorizing the upset bid process. Uh, this is at uh, 2011 South Crow 10 Highway and a couple other little properties that are adjacent to that. Uh, my understanding is that we we want to it would probably be in everyone's best interest to uh, have staff get a uh, appraisal done so that we know exactly where we stand in this very unusual market and make sure we're moving forward with all the information that we need. Um, am I getting all that right? Yes, sir. That right. would um, Debbie Diaz. Um, that would be our recommendation to the board this evening is to allow um, the staff to um, get an appraisal for the market value as of the date. As of the date, right, exactly. Okay, I'm catching up on my paperwork here. Too many papers. There we go. I'm, I'm assuming that you're gonna want uh, two resolutions uh, and, uh, or two motions rather. Uh, and uh, I would make an attempt at the first one if, if that's how we need to proceed, Mayor. Uh, if, if the town manager- Go ahead. Unless I'm misunderstanding something, I think the only 
motion this evening would be the motion to allow um, the appraisal. And then once right. we get the appraisal, gotcha. we can come back gotcha. and um, look okay. at the other resolution. And I'll defer to the town attorney if I'm incorrect. Okay, I, I misread that. You're 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 on the money. Um, so, Mayor, with that, I, I would make a motion that uh, we uh, uh, recommend staff to um, take action um, to um, obtain an up-to-date appraisal so that the, there's knowledge and understanding of the current market value of the site. John Windley here. I'll second that. All right, we've got a great uh, motion and a second there. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go back to the roll call vote. Mr. Winley and Mr. Gray in the affirmative. Ms. Ingram, how do you vote? Yes. And Mr. McAvoy, how do you vote? Yes. And I am also in the affirmative. Uh, thank you for doing that, Ms. Manager. And we will uh, find out how that goes uh, at the next meeting. I, I don't know. I guess like a lot of uh, appraisals are taking a lot, a lot of time right now. So I guess it, we'll it does. do it as soon and, and as we can. Would, right. And this is um, this would be a commercial appraisal, which there, we do have limited um, commercial appraisers, um, yeah. but we do have um, some available and I'll be making that contact tomorrow. Okay, thank you for doing that. We're look, looking forward to, to the results there. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank uh, you, thank you, board. Thank you, yeah, interesting process with all of that. So uh, we will not start the upset bid until we have that additional information. Um, and that lets us go back to the agenda, which I got off on the wrong page. All right, so uh, I think that gets us through most of the agenda. Uh, committee reports. Um, I don't think the West Side Recreation Group has met since last time, but do you, have you guys picked a date for the next time or is that still time we, in flux? We had, Mayor, we had picked a date, but uh, due to the uh, increase in the positive results uh, or tests from uh, uh, COVID, uh, we uh, decided it would be best if we hold off. Um, so, so we have not scheduled uh, a meeting at this time. Um, and, and I think that that's in the best interest of everyone. Um, so, uh, and then the, uh, the other uh, committee report that I have is gonna be uh, on the uh, uh, GEACC. Uh, Michael has uh, finalized and closed out our uh, uh, last transaction, our, our report and uh, our next meeting will be on the 28th. Uh, the Friday is the uh, submittal date for um, uh, our request, and I talked to Michael this afternoon. He's going to have that ready uh, to go to skip, and uh, we'll we'll be on target with trying to get some more money for us uh, for for that committee uh, from that committee. So that's all I have on that, Mayor. Okay, super. Thanks. Thanks for that update. Um, it reminded me that. Uh, well, I'll get to that in my my report. Let's see, uh, in, any other committee reports before I get off track there? I think that might be it. Uh, we just got through the holidays, so I guess uh, not much going on during the holidays there. Um, commissioner's agenda, uh, Terry, did you have anything else while I got you on the screen there? Uh, no, sir. All right, um, Mr. McAvoy, did you have anything for your commissioner's agenda? No, sir. Miss Ingram, how about you? No, sir. Not this evening. Mr. Windley? Nothing today. All right. Uh, that brings us to the mayor's agenda. Um, I was trying to see if I had missed anything in the back of the packet. Sometimes I, sometimes I miss things. But I did want to say that I did have a nice meeting with Aaron. Ugh, I hate when I forget people's last names. Um, from Nature Conservancy. McCall. Uh, McCall, there it is. Um, he gave me a nice tour of, of all the things they've got going on back there. And uh, I, you know, you think you know a place and then, and then you get the expert to show you around. There is a, a great deal of fishing back there and there have been some improvements in some places that I hadn't, hadn't realized and there were a number of years ago. Um, so it was great to have a conversation with him. He, he extends his offer to all of you, my fellow board members, if you'd like to get a behind the scenes tour of of the inner workings of the Nature Conservancy and all the interesting moving parts of the private property. And, and I, I didn't really realize, I knew they were a national organization, but they're an international organization with millions and millions of acres in, uh, that they manage. And uh, it's a quite, quite an operation. And it was, a, I forget what the day was, but uh, it was 
packed. It was nowhere to park and people were all in there. It was a beautiful day, uh, middle of December and uh, glad I got that opportunity. So uh, I think that's it for my mayor's agenda. Um, town manager, your agenda? Nothing this evening, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, Casey, did you have anything? Is Casey still on? Is it down town attorney's agenda? Nothing for me, Mayor. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, consent agenda. That's what I was trying to, there was a word I couldn't think of earlier and, and we were talking about a public hearing, but I'll, I will let the town manager uh, go over it for us. Yes, sir. We got, got the consent agenda this evening. The first item is minutes from the December 14th, 2020 um, Board of Commissioners meeting, the monthly report from November 2020, the annual certification of firefighters, um, the scheduling of the public hearing that you were referring to earlier, Mayor. This is a conditional use site plan for the Bermuda Bay PUD, um, amendment site plan for two four story multifamily structures and associated site improvements. Um, this was forwarded up from the planning board recommending the um, public hearing. And we would um, request the board of commissioners establish the public hearing date for Wednesday, January the 27th, 2021 at 6 p.m. The approval of the consent agenda will place this action in the record of the minutes and recommend approval of this consent agenda as presented. And a motion would be in order. This is Ivy Ingram. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. John Windley here. I will second that. Oh, you're muted, Ben. Mayor, you're muted. Dang, did it again. <laughs> COVID. Oh, Zoom. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting if we didn't do it two or three times. Um, okay. So I was just <laughs> I was just saying to myself here in this room um, that I just wanted to note that uh, after a really tough spring, um, and there's still a lot of tough times in a lot of areas, I noticed that I was looking at the numbers that uh, our mixed beverage tax for the year is down by 56%. I feel bad for anybody who's pouring drinks for a living. Um, but on the, on the sunnier side, occupancy was really strong all fall. And, and you could see that in the, in the variance there on the occupancy tax where we really filled back in nicely in the fall. And I hope that that helps us out when we start planning the 2021-22 uh, the budget here as we get into the spring and, and, and uh, moving towards July 1. Um, but that's all I had uh, other than that. Um, we, is there any further discussion other than that? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call, roll call vote. We've got uh, Ivy and uh, Mr. Winley in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Gray, how do you vote? Yes. And Mr. McAvoy, how do you vote? Yes. And I'm in the affirmative as well. We now have a consent agenda. Uh, thank you all for that. Uh, the next item on our agenda is one more opportunity for public comment. Uh, three minutes for a person, five minutes for a group. Uh, is there anybody out there who would like to be brave enough to figure out how to raise your hand on Zoom and, and weigh in? You got to have fun with this, right? Yeah, that's I see, right. I see Terry laughing over there. Yeah, you do a great job, Mayor. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, got, got to keep myself. Mr. Mayor. Game. Yes. Mr. Mayor, no one's raised their hand. Okay, uh, we appreciate that. At the same time, I know a lot of folks are out there listening. A lot of folks will be. Um, listening to this possibly later uh, so they can skip over the boring parts and uh, get to whatever they're interested in. Um, I hope the discussions uh, among all the groups that are excited about the way forward for, for our recreation world uh, keep on going forward. And um, since we have no uh, response to public comment, I think we are out of things to talk about. So we're looking for a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn, Mayor. Second. So motion Motion from Mr. McAvoy and a, a second from Mr. Gray. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a quick roll call vote there. Mr. Gray and Mr. McAvoy in the affirmative. Ms. Ingram, how do you vote? Yes. And Mr. Windley, how do you vote? Yes. And affirmative from the mayor. And that is a wrap. 
Mic drop. We have made it through yet another <laughs> Zoom meeting, and we will live through this yet. Uh, everybody stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, I will see you again soon. Take care. Great Thank job, everybody. That's thanks. Right. Thanks. Great. Thanks for everything, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.